have 2% Native American ancestry? Tony yells after reading her genetic ancestry results. It completely contradicts what her grandma had been telling her all these years to explain her high cheekbones and silky black hair. Tony, would you like to meet your relatives from across the world in red? She swiftly clicks yes, knowing at best it would be some distant cousin she already knew about in South Carolina. In fact, it was in South Carolina last year during Christmas when her family was doing the family ritual of watching Roots. You know the part right after Chicken George discover his master is also his daddy? The program cuts to commercial. Find out your genetic ancestry results today. We're giving away 10,000 free genetic ancestry tests to African Americans. A cleverly marketed ad from a genetics ancestry company that played during, that played during Roots that you knew African Americans would watch. Tony, would you like to meet your relatives in red? She says yes. Huh, this is like Facebook. <laughs> she connects with one of her relatives. She didn't know she had a sister who lived all the way in Zimbabwe. She plans a visit to visit her sister, Maya. And in addition to visiting her sister, she plans to visit Nigeria because 60% of her ancestry could be traced to Nigeria. Moments before boarding her flight, she gets a notification. Tony, would you like to see your updated results at Red? Her results changed. She clicks yes and now learns moments before boarding her flight that her African ancestry that was once traced to Nigeria is now an even spread across the entire slave coast. She plans the trip nonetheless. She goes. She visits Maya in Zimbabwe and after she goes to Nigeria. The trip felt familiar. The languages were as though she could understand them as if she had knew them but never studied them. The herbs and the food tasted like the southern cooking that she remembered as a child. The dances, she felt like she knew them, had never done these dances before. And several people came up to her saying that they knew her, that she looked familiar. On her plane ride home, she comes to the realization that her reasons for doing this genetic ancestry test, to belong to a tribe, to trace these roots where the results had changed, to explain her high cheekbones, her Native American ancestry, was all a distraction from the identity she already had. She goes home, a scientist gives her a call. They tell Tony that she has a rare genetic mutation in a gene called PCSK9. The scientist asks Tony if she has any siblings. In fact, I, I do. She calls her sister, Maya, and convinces Maya to send over her DNA. They're gonna participate in the study about cholesterol lowering medication, since they both have these rare mutations despite having different moms. They were shocked. They enroll in the study. Two months later, Tony's looking at TV. She sees the scientist. The scientist says, new lipid-lowering medication found in two African-descendant women with rare genetic mutations. Tony gasps, coming to the realization those two women were her and Maya. This was a dream I had. It was fueled by the thing I was doing the night before. I was writing an op-ed piece called 46 Chromosomes and a Mule. about a poorly marketed genetic ancestry ad that glamorized slavery. During this moment, I came back to this double consciousness. W.E.B. Du Bois coined this term double consciousness as a psychosocial divide to explain two opposing black experiences. This was all too familiar to me. Having a PhD, I revere the power of the genome. I understand its abilities to predict and mitigate detrimental health outcomes. But as a system, I'm aware of the lack of ethical research and general compassion for communities of color. 
I first learned about this double consciousness when I was in college. Cell biology class, I was learning about the most common human cell line, HeLa cells. The science part of my double consciousness was so excited to learn about this new creation that could be promised in research labs. The cis side had no idea that the name HeLa came from Henrietta Lacks. A black woman whose cervical cancer cells were, mis were used without her consent for research. When I was doing research for this article, this felt so familiar to that Henrietta Lacks story. I was looking up this gene that I was familiar with on my genetic side, PCSK9, because I knew that discoveries from this gene had led to the business of selling data from genetic ancestry companies and pharmaceutical companies for billions of dollars. I knew the science. What I didn't know as a cis though, is that two scientists found rare mutations in this gene in two black women. Who were these black women? These two black women were the first parallel to this reality of research in my dream. But there were other parallels. For one, the free test that Tony received is a free test that sits on my bookshelf to this day in Crown Heights. I've never taken that genetic test. I received it when I was a graduate student for free. A free marketing ad giving out 10,000 free tests to African Americans. I was a young PhD student doing similar research. I knew then that the results were a little bit too undeveloped. But most importantly, I knew that test really wasn't free. Another realization I came to is Tony's obsession of wanting to explain her racially ambiguous features. Her high cheekbones, or as we like to say, have an Indian in your family. Now, Christopher Columbus coined this term Indian, a very derogatory term to explain Native American ancestry. But it also is a common phrase used within the black community to explain racial features that, do not, that are not as close to whiteness. I've never thought about having Native American ancestry. However, the thought that my fair skin traumatizes me, knowing that generations of black women had undergone interracial raping is the cause of my fair skin. That trauma pains me every time I look at that test on my bookshelf. Another parallel was Tony not knowing why her results changed. She was surprised, she was caught off guard. It is one of my passions to make sure that everyone in the community when doing genetic tests are aware of the why, are aware and understand the research, understand the interpretation around these results. So that's what I do on my podcast, in those genes. Some of y'all get that, some of y'all won't. <laughs> and on the podcast, I use black culture to teach genetic concepts. So I'm gonna give you guys a little taste. Let's talk about why Tony's results changed in the first place. Well, what happens? You send in your DNA to these companies. They take your DNA and compare it with other samples that they have in the database. What they report back to you is how similar your data is with other samples that they have. So as you could imagine, if your ancestry is tied to a place in the world that is not in the database, what you get is the next best match, which may or may not represent your genetic ancestry. However, as we start to add more samples to the database, it becomes a better representation of the world. Therefore, if we redo the analyses, your results update. In theory, your results should be more accurate, and most times they are. Now, how can we explain this using black culture? Let's go to a cookout. You go to a cookout, and everybody brings salad. Now salad is good, but it doesn't fully represent the food pyramid. In this context, European genomes would be salad. Still human, doesn't necessarily represent world populations. But if we invite more people to the cookout, let's say we get proteins like chicken, Someone else brings bread, like my infamous crawfish bread, carbs. We start to have a representation that, that mimics the food pyramid. Then the cookout gets better. 
We go from having a salad bar to a full-blown Brooklyn block party just by being inclusive. Now, as these companies continue to add data, to add things beyond those European genomes, they become more representative and better. You know, all of this research can help but think, who were they? Who were these women? Were they another Henrietta Lacks story? Did they ever consent to have their DNA used for research and drug discovery? Were they ever compensated for the billions of dollars that were made making this drug? But most importantly, was the lack of research that was done to find out what could happen having those rare mutations. What about them? Where was their research? Where were the drugs for the billions of dollars for them? In July, early this year, I found out that 63% of insurance providers do not even cover the drug. Who was this drug for? We know that most uninsured Americans are largely black and brown. We also know that a lot of things have not been done. There are a lot of unanswered questions. But this isn't anything new. In 2012, research dollars for cystic fibrosis are estimated at $220 million compared to sickle cell disease that has research of $65 million. Now, interestingly enough, sickle cell disease affects 70,000 more individuals in the US. So you would think something that's affecting more people should receive more funding. But no, I won't comment on why. I will tell you that cystic fibrosis largely affects European descendants, while sickle cell disease largely affects African descendants. This paper describes it as structural violence. Hmm, that was new to me. Again, I just kept coming back to this idea of what do we know about genetics right now? What do our communities know about genetics right now? It all seems to focus on a past and not a future. Were our futures ever prioritized? Are they even thought about? Do our futures matter? So let's go to the future. A comedy sketch so once framed a future where African descendants got their genetic ancestry results and connected them to the European descendants of their slave owners. And in return, they got, they got monetary uh, value, monetary proceeds from those European descendants. Now, this might not ever happen, but what can happen is a shift in our consciousness to not only think about our genetic ancestries, but to also think about our health. So how can we do that? The first thing we can do is continue genetics education, making genetics accessible to everyone, just like on my podcast. Can you imagine every African descendant in the world knowing that their genomes are the most rich and varied? And the reason for our rich and varied genomes is a beautiful story of how the genome has survived and thrived through drastic changes in climate and environment, famine, hunger, and even slavery? That's powerful. This is the story that these companies should be telling. Not any fairy tale about slavery, just science. But what if we were the primary shareholders of our DNA? Maybe we could create generational wealth. We could think about selling our DNA to well-intended companies who market the science. And those companies giving all access to the data to us. At which point we can decide if we want to participate in the next lipid lowering medication that may or may not help in sickle cell disease. We become the owners of what we own, our DNA. But let's think outside of the monetary value what are the things that we can, can be gained from the genome? Everyone has 
for the most part, the same genome since the day you were born. Within each of us are mutations, just like the mutations discovered to get the PCSK9 drug. In stage kidney disease is a good example of this. We've detected variants in a gene called APOL1 that may or may not predict your risk for developing the disease. We can detect this variant as early as conception, before you were even born. And you can determine if you will be at higher risk or lower risk. Imagine having this information. What could you do? Could you change your lifestyle? This could greatly increase and benefit your life, maybe even save your life. Why is this not marketed? Well, this is the future that I want to be a part of. This is a future where I can see myself doing a genetic ancestry test, any genetic test. This future is not here yet, but it can be. In the beginning, I told you guys a story about two women, Tony and Maya. And in reality, these two women were Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou. Two women who greatly influenced my life and left a legacy on this world. They left a legacy that will transcend generations for people they've never met. Many of us don't think that we have this power, but we do. This is us. This is us. Within the genome lies access and privilege to predict and ensure our futures. Millions and millions of mutations, just like what were found in the PCSK9 drug. Will we step into this power and out of our ignorance? Will we change the way we think about genetic testing to ensure our futures? Hmm, I really hope so. This might all seem like a whimsical dream that I had about the future, but together we can make this a reality. Because a future without us is not a future at all. <laughs>